It's the Opperman Report. Join digital forensic investigator and PI Ed Opperman for an in-depth discussion of conspiracy theories, strategy of New World Order resistance, high-profile court cases in the news, and interviews with expert guests and authors on these topics and more. It's the Opperman Report. And now, here is investigator Ed Opperman. Okay, welcome to the Opperman Report. I'm your host, private investigator Ed Opperman. Uh, you can find me at Opperman Investigations and Digital Forensic Consulting through my website, emailrevealer.com. Our archives of all our past shows, like 1,700 hours of shows, seven years worth, worth of shows, uh, you can find at Spreaker.com. And I, if you sign up at Spreaker.com for free, uh, you get an email notification anytime I put up new content. And uh, there's a chat room. And currently, I play uh, two hours uh, of repeats every night, Monday to Friday. Actually, seven nights a week, uh, we put up new content. Uh, at Spreaker.com, you go there to find out. Uh, my next guest today is a, a filmmaker named uh, Mia Donovan. You can find her website at MiaDonovan.com. Uh, but today we're going to be talking about this incredible film. She just sent me a link to it the other day. I sat down yesterday and watched it. It brought back so many memories of my youth back in New York City and really captured the, the spirit and the energy of that time. And she's a young woman. I don't know how she pulled this off. Uh, but it, she really captured uh, the, the energy that was going on at the time, back in the late 70s and early 80s. Uh, you can find the film called uh, uh, Dope is Death at iSteelFilm.com. That's E-Y-E-S-T-E-E-L Film.com. And, and there's going to be a, a couple of film festivals coming up. One is the Doxa Film Festival in Vancouver, uh, 18 to the 26th, and the Hot Docs in Toronto in June. And those are online film festivals, so anybody can watch them from anywhere they want, anywhere in the world. Mia Donovan, are you there? Hi. Thanks oh. for having me. Oh, thank you so much for coming on the show. I really enjoyed this film. Uh, tell the audience about yourself. Who is Mia Donovan? Um, so I've been doing documentary film for 12 years, and um, I'm really interested in documenting counter narratives to a lot of events that got a lot of media attention. Um, like the first film is called Inside Lara Rocks, and it's about this young woman who contracted HIV while shooting porn in the early 2000s, and she felt very exploited by the media, and so we did this film together um and then after the second film is called deprogrammed which is about um looking at the history of cult deprogramming um from the 70s the work of this the first cult deprogrammer named ted patrick who people would hire parents would often hire it was usually parents that would hire him to involuntarily remove or kidnap, forcefully remove people from quote-unquote cults. Um, and so that was um, a, a pretty uh, intense like film to, to research. And then, you know, this latest film. Um, I'm really I interested in just like the counter-narrative of this movement and how this movement was so criminalized and just like the, you know, the histories of acupuncture in America and how it has these radical roots in the Black Panthers and the Young Lords. So this film, you just, you're just shopping it around now. It's in film festivals and stuff. Dope is death. Yeah. Yeah. How would you describe this film, Dope is Death? What would we find there? Um, well, it's a documentary that is, it's, it's all first person point of view mostly of people former black panthers and young lords and different activists who were all like 19 20 years old in 1970 and came together in the south bronx to create a political detoxification program for heroin addicts at a time when mandatory methadone programs were the norm were were popping up all over new york city and within a few years, um, they discovered, they learned about acupuncture, came to Montreal, which is where I live, and learned acupuncture here because we had the first acupuncture school in North America. And we're talking like acupuncture outside of Chinese communities. And the school was 
was a French language school, but the teacher and um, his son believed in what these what these activists were trying to do to help the people that they gave them scholarships and taught them, uh, like made a program in English just for them. And then um, the film is also, there's a lot of archives um, uh, and it really looks at the early days of the war on drugs and what these activists, mostly Black Panthers and Puerto Rican nationalists were doing to kind of combat um, what they perceived as chemical warfare. And that is that the, the young activists were being um, subjected to heroin addiction uh, that would cause them to limit their, their, their effectiveness as activists. Yeah, I mean, that the their political analysis was that the drugs that were being flooded into the black and Puerto Rican communities was was strategic and was like a low intensity warfare to pacify resistance. So they were very aware of this and um, they that's one reason why they, they also thought met, they saw methadone as the same as heroin, both serving the same purpose. So it was very important for them to treat their community to detox people off drugs without using methadone and the the corporate medical establishment the standard medical establishment at the time only recognized really methadone was the only recognized effective treatment so as soon as they started to advocate and really use acupuncture it was like they became a red flag and started um there was like surveillance that started happening and um, eventual like possible <clears throat> infiltration by the CIA and um, the city and the state saw what they kind of criminal tried to criminalize the image of this program and label them as like indoctrinating radicals. Now, I grew up in that area. I grew up in the Bronx, and then moved to Staten Island. And in my late teen years, I was hanging out on the Lower East Side. I, I saw firsthand friends of mine that were activists with the Yippies and stuff like that that became addicted to heroin and uh, destroyed their lives. They died at very young ages. How did Mia Donovan become exposed? And I see the reality of the film, okay? And, and I, you capture that time incredibly. But how did Mia Donovan, living in uh, uh, Canada... Uh, become ex- exposed to this information. How would you learn about this? Well, there was two things. Well, I, I met Mario Wexu, who is the acupuncturist from Montreal, who taught them. He's a friend, a friend of mine's father. So he was. She was telling me about her father and what he, the work he did to help get this, to help with this program with the Black Panthers. And he, she said he taught. Um, Tupac Shakur's stepdad, Matulu Shakur, and I was just found it really interesting, and I had never heard about it. And then on a more personal level, my stepbrother has been on and off of, has been battling, like has had substance abuse problems for since he was like 12. So he had been on and off of methadone. Still, still, he's still on and off of drugs. So I've I've always been interested in drug treatment programs and very critical of you know different approaches to drug treatment so when I first heard about that it was a bit like wow that's so interesting and also like does it work like that's like I just kind of like became interested in it and then started to write Matula Shakur in prison and I think that New York City itself is just like a very like iconic like even people that didn't grow up there like we're so we have such a strong um kind of collective nostalgia for the New York that we saw in films in the 70s and 80s. So I think I kind of had some sense, like just from the bands I used to listen to. I don't know. I just like New York City is just, um, I think just, I knew that I had to try to represent the context of New York City as best as I could with archives. So that was like years of really trying to like set that tone properly with um, with the archives and the fact that you're saying that it, it, you could feel that spirit is really like 
complimentary to me. Thank you. Oh, yeah. I, I grew up. That was my formative years. You know, Lower East Side, I mean, CBGBs, you know, and all that stuff. Washington Square Park, you know, all those. Uh, so I knew you really did capture it. Now, uh, first of all, about your your half-brother, you said, has he tried yeah. the acupuncture? Um. He doesn't have. We're from um, we're from New Brunswick, Canada, like in the Maritimes, and there he would be totally open to trying it. But I haven't. He doesn't have access to it there. Um, but and we don't see each other that often. But I think he would. I I, I it's. I don't know yet, but I I feel like it could be effective. But I don't. I don't know yet. Yeah, I've told the story here in the air. Where I had a, a very dear friend of mine uh, detox in my apartment for three days, you know, before we could get her into a, a mainstream uh, detox program. And if you've ever been through that, it's just the worst thing you could ever see in your life, and especially when you're dealing with the medical system in the United States and uh, trying to get someone the paperwork. You're sitting there dying in the waiting room while they send you home. Come back tomorrow. You know, it's, it's a nightmare. Sounds awful. It, it really is. Now, you mentioned Dr. Matula Shakur. Who, who is Dr. Matula Shakur? Um, so Matula Shakur is, uh, in 1970, he was a 19-year-old activist from Queens who um, was a member of the Republic of New Africa, but was friends with the Black Panthers. So he was, wasn't was actually a Black Panther. Um, and he grew up with a blind mother and spent all his childhood navigating with his mom, the healthcare system and the welfare system, and understood at an early age that the medical the medical establishment in the U.S. treated black people differently, black poor people differently. So he had this consciousness of um, that was developing, and this interest in being self having uh, this interest in working towards self-determination for people's health. And he also, when he when he got older and recognized what was going on with the drug addiction and healthcare, he just really got, um, when he first learned about acupuncture, he was really attracted to it for different reasons, for more than just treating people with heroin, but he saw this as a tool towards self-determination of, of black people, black Americans. And... Um, so that's then that's why it was important for him to find a school where he could get an actual doctorate degree in acupuncture to be taken seriously. And at that time, like I mentioned earlier, the only school in North America was in Montreal. So he was really determined to get to t- to really like take this to to be taken seriously. Um, and you know, that's that's uh, that's like. He's much more than that. That's like kind of the intro to him. Like it, the acupuncture program wouldn't have started without him um, really bringing acupuncture there. Before that, they, they for the first two years of the Lincoln Detox, they were doing a methadone detox, a 10-day methadone detox program, which in itself was pretty revolutionary at the time because everybody, the people were pushing for methadone maintenance. So, and then when he first started working at the Lincoln detox, they were doing the 10 day detox. So they would give you like incrementally lower doses of methadone within for the 10 day period. And then of course, once like day 10 came around, people were really nervous to go off completely. Hmm. So when he, the first, he learned one point before he, he, he learned like the lung point in the ear. So then he would just start, it started with him experimenting with people like, when they would get off, like once they reached the 10 days, he would start doing one point in the ear and it would help ease people and make them feel more relaxed. And then he developed it there into a five point ear acupuncture protocol. But even before there ever was a Lincoln detox, there was a Lincoln hospital. And Dr. Yeah. Yeah, Dr. Shakur was part of the takeover of Lincoln hospital? Um, yeah. So there was a huge group of people. Um, there was the Young Lords, Black Panthers, different community activists, um, a healthcare uh, atrium, which was the Health Care Unity Revolutionary Movement. So that, those were healthcare workers that were um, 
kind of politically political radicals or political activists and so they um they all came together because the lincoln hospital was dilapidating um it was kids were getting lead paint poisoning um people were dying in the hospital like it was just like a terrible there was rats everywhere it was a terrible hospital the majority of the patients were puerto rican and all the no doctors spoke spanish so they at first wanted to like you know have some say into the hospital like have some community involvement in the hospital so they took it over and it was successful i mean to the point that the the city did listen to them and met some of their demands and eventually gave the money to start the Lincoln Detox. And, and it's only been 40 years later that now we can go into neighborhoods in Seattle and D.C. and take over entire neighborhoods. <laughs> like uh, 40 years of what, sleeping uh, on our uh, achievements here? Now, you went, mm-hmm. yeah, I know. Now, you went and interviewed uh, Felipe, uh, Felipe Feliciano, right, from uh, Young Lords. Yes. Did you reach out to anybody else like Pablo Guzman or even uh, uh, Ronald Rivera? Uh, no, I didn't. Um, you mean, um, who did you say? Sorry, I didn't hear the name. Geraldo Rivera and Pablo Guzman yeah. were also a... Uh, uh, oh, yes. Mm-hmm. I did speak to... I didn't speak to Geraldo Rivera, but I did speak to Pablo Guzman yeah. on the phone, and he helped me a lot, but did, didn't want to be interviewed. Well, that's interesting. Um, did he give a reason? Yeah, I think uh, he was... I'm not sure. Like, I know that he had some um, family things going on. I okay. Somebody, there was some, might have been personal reasons, just timing. But he was, uh, he was helpful. And, um, yeah. Off the air, your contact with Felipe Luciano. Um, how did he feel uh, looking back on, on his work with the Young Lords? Was he proud of it? Was he, did he feel like a, he could have done more? Um, he seemed very proud of it. I mean, he was he was like 19 or 20 then, so it's like it's pretty amazing how in tune they were to the community needs at that young age. Um, I, I know that Felipe left the Young Lords shortly after the takeover, but I'm not sure the details. I didn't really get into it with him. But he was there uh, for the takeover and for the other healthcare initiatives that the Young Lords did before they took over the hospital, such as um, they took over an x-ray machine right. in Manhattan because it was just sitting at a street corner in the Upper East Side or maybe the Upper West Side, I can't remember. And there was a TB problem in Harlem and the truck would never go up there. So the bunch of the young lords went and hijacked it. And the x-ray technicians be- were on their side. So they, like, once they understood why they were being hijacked, the x-ray technicians, like, agreed with them and went up to Harlem to test people for TB. So he was part of that as well. Felipe was. Yeah. Yeah, I believe he left the young lords to become a, a DJ uh, on, the, on a radio station. Uh, to do a music DJ. Yeah, I, I mean, it's. I'm sure I just didn't. Um, yeah, yeah. I didn't talk to him about it. Now, what was uh, the success rate of of using acupuncture to treat heroin addiction? And, and were they treating other uh, ailments as well? Well, I mean, they don't. I don't know if they have actual statistics, but um, from that time, but they. We have to also remember it wasn't just acupuncture. They also gave um, political education classes, which is what they called political education classes, but it was classes that they would... The idea was, like, if, you, if you're Puerto Rican or black in America today and back then and you go to mainstream public school, you only learn history from a European perspective. And that makes that can lead to a feeling of inferiority for black Americans and Puerto Rican Americans. So they felt it was very important to provide these classes that would provide history for Puerto Ricans and black Americans. And that that was also part of their, their treatment and the healing that they were doing. So um, it was really the acupuncture, the political education classes, the, the feeling of community 
uh, that the Lincoln Detox provide it. And I mean, by their accounts, the success rate was very, very high. I just don't, um, I don't know exactly. I mean, in general, I don't even know what the, like, I think standard like methadone maintenance and other forms of drug treatment, it, the success rate is pretty low. Well, it was successful general. enough that the, the, the city and the government and the cops thought it was threatening enough that they shut it down. Yeah. yeah. Like it was, yeah, definitely. And and they also were, when they were getting people off of heroin and people were becoming empowered and becoming actively involved in the community, so protesting for rent strikes and for learning about getting registered to vote, so doing all these very productive things that was that you know to make their community better and this of course was seen as threatening to a a capitalist society that want that needs you know to be in a position where um there's a, a you know where there's like um a hierarchy sorry well also too you know we know back looking back in hindsight that you know well, that heroin that was going to, to Harlem uh, was coming in through Fort Bragg from Vietnam, you know, CIA controlled, all kinds of uh, uh, shenanigans going on there. Then we saw Iran-Contra, the same thing. The Iran-Contra war being uh, financed by crack cocaine through Priori Rick Ross up in California. The same thing repeating itself over and over. So I'm sure if these guys were a threat to people in the, the, uh, the market consuming that heroin, that they would have to be stopped. Yeah. I mean, there's like... And also, I think um, there's that. There's also, you could look at it like uh, Lili, uh, Eli Lilly, the makers of methadone. Like, there was this group of people saying, right, like, we've right. got a non chemical solution to this problem when, you know, methadone maintenance was, there was all these cases, like, methadone maintenance was a huge, huge thing at that time. And, later became regulated but anybody could get a license it was not anybody but it was pretty easy to get a license to start a methadone maintenance clinic and so a lot of doctors who could get these licenses were profiting off of methadone um which was i didn't go too deep into it for the film but it's you know that's a very addictive drug like it's uh um and it gets you high too yeah. so yeah it's really no better life and you're on it. Yeah. I, I met a guy just recently. As a matter of fact, I was getting my car fixed. Told me he was on her, uh, methadone for forty years. Forty years yeah. on methadone. You know? mm-hmm. Now, what were your politics coming into this, and, and has your politics changed after being exposed to all this information? I mean, I think my like my politics have always been very. Uh, I think I'm probably I'm definitely more. Um, radical in my thinking, but maybe not. I think it just affirmed a lot of stuff that I was already aware of in terms of white supremacy and just um, I, I mean, I think I think it's clear if you watch the film um, that, you know, I'm, I'm Canadian, it's a bit different here, but so I, I mean, just things like things like the fact, just the idea that you guys don't have universal health care is so crazy for us. Um, it's crazy for political. us, too. It's crazy for <laughs> us, too. I got a torn bicep here right now. I got one arm I can use. And uh, no hope of getting this thing fixed uh, unless I can come up with 12000 bucks cash, you know? Uh, That's so awful. I know. It's I'm crazy. It's crazy. <laughs> mm-hmm. Did you travel down to New York? Yeah, a lot. Um I traveled to New York a lot. I mean, most of the people I interviewed, they, they are in New York. Um, and I would visit Matulu a lot in prison, and he at the time was in Victorville outside of L.A., but I couldn't interview him on camera. Right. But, yeah, I went to New York a lot. 
Okay, because this might be a good time to take a commercial break. Uh, when mm-hmm. we come back, I'm going to ask you about, because um, you did have access to a lot of people, people that um, aren't well-known, like May 19th. You know, no one's heard of May 19th. You can't even, or, or accurate information about May 19th, or, or these different groups like that. And we want to talk about Matula Shukar. How did he wind up in prison, okay? What did this guy really do to wind up in prison? Uh, we're here today with uh, Mia Donovan, uh, a filmmaker behind the film Dope is Death. Excellent movie. I just watched it yesterday. Incredibly good. Uh, you can find it at iSteelFilm.com. E-Y-E-S-T-E-E-L Film.com. Mia Donovan's uh, website is MiaDonovan.com. Uh, there's a couple of uh, film festivals coming up. One is the Doxa Film Festival in Vancouver from the 18th to the 26th and Hot Docs in Toronto in June. Now you can find, you can watch these online. So you can go online and sign up for this stuff and, and catch up this film. It's excellent work. And I want to thank our friend John Potash for in- introducing us to Mia and setting up the show for us. Um, uh, John's done excellent work. Now, John, by the way, trained under Dr. Matula Shakur. He's trained uh, in drug therapy and uh, addiction treatment. And also, too, uh, he's done a great film about Tupac Shakur, who is Matula Shakur's stepson. And also, too, his film Drugs as Weapons Against Us, which goes into this whole topic as well. And I'm in that film, by the way, too, so you can catch me in my little portion in that film as well, too. It looks like I'm the co-star, but that's just the way IMDb works. <laughs> but Mia Donovan, are you there? Yes. I was going to ask you, now, how did you get access? I, I know these, especially people like May 19th, you don't hear about them. How did you get access to all these people? I know they're very cautious about who they deal with and who they talk to. They're very, for good reason, you know, they've been thrown in prison and stuff. How were you able to get such access? Well, through Mario Wexu, who was Matulu's teacher of acupuncture, um, that's how I started writing Matulu Shakur, and then I started visiting him many years ago, like maybe eight years ago, and for a few years. And then once Matulu was in bo- in bo- on board, sorry, he um, helped put me in touch with people. And then once I had, was in touch with a few people, then they put me in touch with other people. Gotcha. Makes perfect sense. Yeah. Now. Okay. Mm-hmm. Now, when you're you know, around these uh, type of people, uh, did you experience any COINTEL Pro surveillance, harassment, threats? Um, not personally, but that I'm not personally that I'm aware of, but um, I mean, it's something, you know, that um, I'm definitely aware is, uh, you know, it is possible. Yeah, not yet. <laughs> you know, as the movie gets more popular, you know, not yet. That's the problem. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, but yeah. I mean, I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's just an incredible story and yeah. I really think it's important that people understand uh, either the good that these people did, these people who've been um, strategically criminalized Correct. by now, the government. So yeah. now explain to us now, how could how could this be? That we got a man, Matula Shakur, devotes his life, and he's, he's uh, inspired by his blind mother. He talks about waiting online at the welfare office because his mother couldn't fill out the paperwork, and he, with a little boy he had to do this for his mom. He's inspired by the the uh, infirmities of his mother to go into uh, treatment and, and, and treat heroin addicts and people with drug addictions. And then he op- opens up the, the, the Lincoln Detox Center. Then he opens up his own uh, acupuncture schools. How, you, know, uh, you mentioned he's in prison. How did this man wind up in prison? Uh, well, it's a very complicated story in history. And to understand why he's in prison, we have to understand or learn and understand about COINTELPRO and J. Edgar Hoover's, um, you know, like when, if we go back to 1969 and J. Edgar Hoover says the Black Panthers are the biggest threat to the nation and how he felt things like the breakfast program that the Black Panthers were doing when they were feeding 50,000 children breakfast every day, how he saw that as a threat and how, um, you know, the COINTEL Pro papers, it says that, you know, there's orders to, uh, there's moment, um, memos about how the CIA program needed to disrupt and discredit these organizations. So there's this history that followed, this this history of COINTEL Pro followed Matulu and the other activists, you know, their, their work until the 80s. 
um, and there was a famous Brinks armored truck robbery in 1981 where there was a lot of um, left-wing radicals connected to this and Matulu Shakur was charged under the RICO Act so he was accused of being the alleged ringleader of this quote-unquote criminal organization and the government alleged that Matulu Shakur and his political associates were in fact a criminal organization so it's a very complicated case there's no physical evidence linking Matulu to these crimes the evidence is all um, like I like his political connections basically like so, yeah. Um. I, I would encourage the audience to go back and, and look in our archives for a show we did with Betty Metzger, uh, who wrote the book The Burglar, or The Burglary, which was how we discovered the COINTEL program existed. Uh, these young activists, I forget what it was, like Michigan or something like that, Minneapolis, uh, broke into the FBI office on the day of the Muhammad Ali fight against Frazier because they knew everybody would be busy and, and, and off. Uh, and when they just sp- sp- all these files, there was stuff in there. People think, oh, COINTEL, well, yeah, well, they're keeping an eye on those terrorists, those SDS and those weather on the ground guys. Yeah, they should be doing that. The black pan, black militants, you know. Right? But they were saying in these documents that if there's a, a congregation of six or eight black men on the corner, they should be watched. They, that has to be broken up. Black churches they were targeting. Uh, so it's a lot more uh, than the average person thinks. And COINTEL Pro, is, I think, I believe it goes on until today. And, and if you go back to the time right, when these people were being rounded up and arrested, Matul Shakur, as far as I know, there's no evidence whatsoever he had any uh, knowledge or there's no a record of him planning or, or anything like that. But that's just that the theory was he was going to receive some funds from the robbery uh, because when he got uh, picked up and other people got picked up in that case, people I knew uh, down at WBAI and around the Yippie headquarters and stuff like that, we were concerned that we were going to be rounded up next. And I tell you something, the film captures that fear too at the end when, when the, at the end when the, your people you're interviewing are talking about uh, how they're being rounded up and on these RICO charges with no direct involvement in anything it, it's a, brought back a, a chill uh, that I experienced as a young man in New York City well yeah yeah I, I mean it's uh, it's interesting to hear you say that because I've so many people that were just connected to Matulu in the acupuncture clinic were brought in it just they really the, the they really um, they yeah they, they, they really cast a, a huge net in terms of like um, trying to interrupt these left wing activists. It was extremely heavy handed. And and in your Heavy film, handed, yeah. yeah, in your film too, you point out about how Reagan, when he was running for office, went down to the South Bronx, and you could tell he was personally agitated by his experience down there. And then it, this happened under Reagan that all these people were being rounded up. Mm-hmm. Doctor uh, Matul Shakur, he's in prison right now. Uh, how old is he? He's seventy now, and unfortunately, his health is. Um, he was diagnosed with bone marrow cancer in October, and he's already been, he's had a stroke in the past, he has diabetes, he's an elder, he's, you know, he's in a prison where there was um, at least one case of COVID. Um, his family and friends and supporters have um, been trying to get a compassionate release for him, and he's been rejected twice already. Um, so it's, he, and he's been inside for 34 years and he's a model prisoner. And it's just, it's when, you, you know, through getting to know Matulu and just like, it makes these, you know, these cases of political prisoners so much, so much more real. Um, it There's the idea that he can be considered a threat to society and that needs to be kept that this idea that he needs to be kept inside because he's a threat to society is absolutely absurd. Um, it's a waste of taxpayers' money to keep him inside. He, he can only bring good to the community. And, you know, it'd be great to see him be able to live the rest of his years with his family. When you visit him in there, what, how is his... his um, how is his... Uh... How's he holding up when, when you go in there and visit him? 
his spirit. I mean, he's he's a very hopeful person. He has he's um, he's a very a very enthusiastic, optimistic individual. He has a lot of hope, and I think that's why he was able to do so much um, during his twenties to help the community, like to get this acupuncture program rolling uh, to to discover these solutions to the problem of addiction and to get people um, motivated like when I would visit him he just like I would leave feeling like wow yeah like there is hope in the world you know like um, he still has that and it's pretty incredible and he's helped mentor a lot of people a lot of young men in prison um, and you know, I think um, yeah, it's it's really interesting, you know, to con- to even consider that he's been labeled like one of the FBI's, you know, top ten most wanted like individuals when he was underground. Like he's just um, he's just like a great he's you know he deserves to be free, and we need to kind of we need to support him and. Um, well, how, yeah. can, how can we support? Are there petitions? Can you write to a yes. governor? What, what would we do? Well, if you go on his website, which is Family and Friends Run, called com, there's up, continuous updates on his case and what um, what people, where they're at and what, what is needed. There's a petition going on now that you can sign and... Um, there's uh, some new cases, like some new, uh, I, I'm not sure, I'm not completely up to date on the latest, but there is, you know, a, an appeal process going on um, to try and get him home. Um, and also he is he is going through, he, I think also, I mean, if anybody wants to donate or write letters, like he's, you know, he's really fighting right now for... Um, uh, for his health, and I'm not sure, you know, like what kind of medical treatment he's getting, but he does have cancer, so there's a lot of urgency to getting him out as soon as possible. It's amazing, too, how many fans of Tupac have no idea who his father was, his stepdad was, and, uh, mm-hmm. and that, that he's sitting rotting away in a prison right now. And, you know, I had the yeah. son of Leonard Peltier on, on the show, too, another one. Really? Uh, oh, yeah, mm-hmm. another one who's a. Uh, uh, on death, I hate to say it, but you know what I mean? In, the, in this point of yeah, their life. It's you know? awful. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and, these are elders and they need yeah. to be out. They've been there for 40 years. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and his Sorry. son talks about, you know, FBI following him to school when he was 10 years old. You know? Mm-hmm. Uh, it's, it's not just the people that they put away in prison, it's the families too. It's, it's, uh... Yes, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> oh, boy. What else about this film haven't I asked you that you want people to know? Well, I mean, I think it's important to know that um, the ear acupuncture protocol that they developed, which is now known as NADA, um, it was incorporated in 1985 by this man named Dr. Michael Smith, who was, when the, when the Lincoln Detox Collective was running the program, Matula, the Black Panthers, the Young Lords, they couldn't perform acupuncture or treat people with acupuncture without a medical doctor present. Mm. That's what made it legal. So when everything went down, when Matulu, when when the program broke, the original program got shut down and all the activists went their separate ways, uh, Dr. Michael Smith incorporated it under his name. So people only now are understanding the real roots of NADA. Um, and it's being used internationally like 600 clinics in the u.s are using the nada protocol to treat people um for drug withdrawal symptoms also anxiety and trauma um after 9 11 there was nada practitioners who set up a tent to treat first responders like firefighters people who were helping with 9 11 to treat them for trauma or anyone so like these services um what they helped bring to the people is being practiced and it, and it is actually out there helping people all over the world. So that's pretty amazing. And we just don't understand where the roots really come from. And it's not that Michael Smith, you know, Michael Smith passed away. He was part of the collective, but he, it, it was, you know, he just didn't give the rightful credit to where it was, you know, to the, the real founders. So that's what we're doing now. We're changing that history. 
Is there still a legacy clinic in in Manhattan or the Bronx where uh, they're still doing these treatments? Well, the 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 Lincoln Detox, which is where John Potash studied later, right. and um, that clinic itself was shut down unfortunately in 2011. But there are all these other clinics, which one of them I was able to shoot in my film. So there are dozens of other clinics around the city. There there are harm reduction clinics that offer the same protocol. So, but the, the, the core program that the Lincoln Detox built, um, the, you know, this one place where, you know, hundreds of people could go a day, like that, that is no longer there, but um, it is still available in New York. That's a shame because, you know, we have a huge uh, resurgence of heroin and, and all opiate addictions uh, going on. It starts out in pills and, and people wind up uh, on heroin because it's cheaper, you know. Now, one thing in the film that uh, I didn't quite understand, you talked about how when they went to China, they visited China to learn more about the acupuncture, and they were surveilled by the American CIA in China? Yes. Um, well, I mean, this is in the film, like, um, I didn't, I don't, I didn't do a lot of, um, I, I, I don't know exactly the details, but this was, everybody who was there corroborated the story that they were being surveilled, but I don't, um, nothing kind of directly came out of it, uh, but they were being watched. I think that it sounds like they were, it was, they were being surveyed all the time um, at the clinic in, in Harlem, at the clinic in the South Bronx, and that was just an extension, like, Oh, yeah. I remember reading through so, the paper, the, the New York Post and the Daily News back at the time, uh, that were right after the Brinks. And uh, they talked, they had these guys under 24 hour surveillance before the, the, the robbery. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was 24 like, hours, man. It, you know, they're following from buildings, they're going from one door, and going up on roofs and jumping over roofs and stuff like that, they're one place to another. 24 hours of surveillance and harassment, a, a drug detox clinic. I think that it was, it was Jackie from the May 19th organization who was in China with them and she said that she never believed the surveillance stories until she went to China was like okay you guys because they all would tell her we're being you know this work we're doing is being we're being watched you know mm -hmm. and then finally when she was in China like it was just so clear um, so now, now, what was that in cooperation with the Chinese the, the CIA was working in cooperation with the Chinese government or, or on their own I guess you have no idea um, I had the impression, I mean, from what I understood was that they, I'm, I'm not sure if it was, I think if, I felt like it might have just been uh, independent. I'm, I'm not okay. sure. Right. I can't add to that. But It'd be fascinating to, to look into that some more. I think that's a whole other film. Like, yeah. Really. <laughs> yeah, I know, yeah. Now, many of the people involved around Branks and May 19th and some of these other activities that were going on at the time, they're out and free and walking around. How come Matula Shakur is still in there when he had no direct hand in anything and these other guys are walking around? Well, I mean, we could talk about, um, like, Susan Rosenberg was um, Bill Clinton, um, I'm sorry with the term, I think clemency. He gave her, she, her sentence was reduced to time served and he let her out. She was sentenced to 67 years. Commuted. And, commuted. Yeah, commuted. So he, uh, when his last day in office, and she, when she went to trial, she was, con even though she was originally, um, she originally went underground to avoid, like, her, the original charges associated with the RICO case. But when they actually caught up with her, she was convicted of separate charges, and then the charges related to Matula Shakur were dropped immediately, which she says goes to show, like, kind of the lack of real evidence in relation to the case of Matulu. It sort of, like, makes it clear that they just wanted to pacify this, these people. It yeah, just so um, the, the audience understands, she was charged with the uh, involvement with the robbery, she went underground, and when they captured her, I guess she had some guns or other um, contraband on yeah. her, they charged her with that, dropped the first charges. Exactly. <laughs> the, the ones that put her on, on the run, they dropped those. Oh, we got you on this. Yeah. We're going to take it. Amazing. It's amazing. Oh, so well, that, you know, protect and serve. That's pretty big. Yeah. And so she recognizes, I mean, I think it's, it's definitely fair to say that there is 
some racial elements here. Right. Uh, a lot of the white activists, I, I, but not all of them, like David Gilbert is still inside, uh, but they're, you know, there's a lot of people, most people associated with the Brinks are out. So Matulu is really the last person to, <sighs> to remain inside. So we got about one minute left. What do you want to leave us with? Um, I just think people should, uh, I mean, the film touches on so many things, and I think that there's a lot of history here that needs to be further research um, for people to really understand what's happening today. I can't thank you enough for coming on the show, and I can't thank John Potash either for, for introducing us. Um, you can find this film, Drug, uh, Dope is Death. Is it Dope is Death? Dope is Death. Dope. Which was one of their slogans back in the day. So, Dope is Death. And you can find it at iSteelFilm.com. E-Y-E-S-T-E-E-L Film.com. Uh, we're talking to Mia Donovan. You can find her website, MiaDonovan.com. She, then there's two other great films on there, too, as well. I can't wait to go back and check those out. Uh, Docs, a film festival in Vancouver, the 18th to the 26th. Hot Docs in Toronto in June. Uh, Mia Donovan, I can't thank you enough. And I can't thank John Potash enough, either. A good companion piece. If you want to sit down and have a double feature, check out Drugs as Weapons Against Us. Uh, John Potash's films about the same topic, man. You know, the government using drugs to, to shut down the left. Mia Donovan, thank you so much. Thank you so much.